I want to make a quick video explaining how the types of knowledge activity would have worked in a face-to-face -face course. So for those students that are remote or purely online, you can kind of get a good feel for how this activity would have worked. So the first thing I would do is we would do the lecture. After the lecture, we'd have this class activity. I would hand out pieces of climbing rope about three to four foot long. And then before we got started, I would ask the class if anybody had any experience tying the double figure eight knot. And for those that raise their hand, I would tell them, do not tie the knot. I don't want anybody to see this. I want this to be a new and novel activity for those that are, are new to this information. And that's what I try to do with these class activities. I try to find information that the average person wouldn't know because I really want to test out these different concepts in court in the class without people having prior knowledge. So I would tell them this is a double figure eight knot. That's declarative knowledge. And I would tell them to go through and read this paragraph. So I'd have this paragraph pulled up on the board, on the smart board, and have them read through this short paragraph. So they would be looking for declarative, conceptual, conditional, and even procedural knowledge if it's in the paragraph. So they're looking for those types of knowledge that they just learned about in the lecture. And I would give them a minute or two to look for it, write down any information they wanted to on a piece of paper. And then I would ask the class, could you tie the knot based on this information? And most people would be like, no, I can't. Okay, what types of knowledge do you see here? So we see declarative knowledge. We also see conditional knowledge. So when would you use this? And so it tells you, it gives you a few examples, not all of them. But those few examples that it gives are also conceptual knowledge, how it links out to other major topics. So if you were in a climbing class, this would be a smaller topic of climbing. If you were going to go out and learn boating, this would be a smaller topic within that topic. We're using it in education to learn types of knowledge, but there's a whole host of not only conceptual knowledge, but also conditional, like when you would use this. And so some people would pick out that, hey, this is a secure and safe knot for climbing. So that is conditional, but it's also conceptual. And that's what I want students to see, that these types of knowledge are not independent of one another. You can get declarative knowledge that's not only factual, but might also be procedural. It might also tell you conditional information. It might also tell you conceptual information. But you need to be able to distinguish between those four to find out what's most important. What do I need to learn first in order to do the activity? So once they've had a chance to look through this, I would pull up a hand-drawn double figure eight. And there are a lot of different ways to tie this knot. In fact, even with the terminology, we're only looking at one aspect of this knot. So I'd say, all right, based on the illustration, before I give you too much information about it, could you do this just visually? And so a handful of students, after I give them two or three minutes, would be able to tie this knot. This is the simplest version of the double figure eight knot. I'd allow them to go through and practice, and then I would actually tell them what's going on. So give them some declarative knowledge of the procedural process. So I say, all right, in the first illustration, right over here, what you're seeing is you're putting a bite in the rope. So you're just a bend in the rope. And this rope, these two here, are going to go behind these two strands. And that's what we see in the next illustration. That if you go behind, that means when you go around the other side, you're going to have to come in front on the next path. And then if I went in front here, that means I'm going to have to go through the back side of this knot. That's what this arrow is indicating, that this actually went through the back side. So I would tell them, hold it up exactly like you see in this illustration. Put a bend in the rope. And so I would give people time to hold it up and match it up to the illustration. That's what I would tell them. 
match it up to what you see on the board. I'd say, okay, take this strand here and bring it behind these two double strands. Have the students do that. Now, take those two strands that just passed behind and pass them in front. And then the students would do that. And then I would say, take this strand and bring it back through the back side. Because if you don't put it through the back side, this is the most common mistake, you just get a square knot. Could you use that for climbing? Yes. But you would never get it untied. It would be really hard to untie if you used a square knot and you fell on it and put some weight on it. That's the reason we're using the double figure eight. So I'd have them go through and then I'd have them dress a knot. Once they got to this point here, have them check. Does it look like a pretzel? If it looks like a pretzel, you're doing an overhand knot, which is the common mistake, which means instead of taking this last step behind, they went in front. So once they get to this, I would have them dress a knot, meaning that they would kind of cinch it down and make sure none of these strands were crisscrossing and that it lays down nice and flush. And that would be the final step of a double figure eight. Now that is not a, a figure eight follow through. You're just doing a figure eight on a butt that you could hook a carabiner here and clip in. You couldn't use this method to tie in to a harness safely. You would have to do the double figure eight follow through or the figure eight follow through. There's a lot of other different names that we have for it here. So not only did I explain the process, I explained some of the common mistakes. So that's all declarative knowledge telling you how this knot is gonna be used. Like this one cannot be used to tie into a traditional harness. It can be used to clip in if you've got a carabiner and then you could use that to climb. And that's normally used in like large groups. Like if you ever go to a park, they'll have people just clipping into a carabiner as opposed to using the traditional figure four or figure eight follow through. You'll also notice, let me see here if I can scale this down for you. This format is exactly what you do on your weekly discussions. I have you give a five to eight sentence description with an in-text citation. Now I know I don't have the reference down at the bottom, but I have you do an illustration. I have you use an APA style figure. This one is 281. So that means in this book that I'm working on, I'm actually redoing a book, there are gonna be well, so far, I'm at 281. There's going to be a lot more. And you notice I have a video link. I did it with a QR code. I don't have y'all do that in class because it confuses students. I just have y'all paste the link in the discussion. So you can see that's elements of what you do on your weekly discussion. So that ties into some of our in-class activities. So the final step on the in-class activity, I would have students scan this QR code with their phone. And there's about four videos linked. And not only does it show the traditional double figure eight that could be clipped into, but it shows the figure eight follow through. And so I tell them, once you've done the, the double figure eight, see if you can do a traditional figure eight follow through that would be used to actually tie into a harness without clipping in with a carabiner and see if you can do that one. But this just reinforces that the types of knowledge are used in almost everything you do. You can also connect the types of knowledge to learning styles. What learning style? Was the visual learning reference more important? Was reading about it more important for you? Watching the videos and actually kinesthetically following along, was that more important? So you can see how we're connecting types of knowledge to the first chapter, which was over learning styles. Which one are more, impo more important to you? Anytime you learn new information, obviously knowing your learning style makes you a more efficient learner, but also understanding what type of knowledge should I learn first with that learning style. That's going to make you even more efficient. Because if you can identify, okay, this is skill-based, that means procedural information. If I was giving, given that alone, I could probably get it. 
but there are times where knowing the conditional information is extremely important. When should I use this? If I don't even know when to use it, I don't even know why this knot is important. And then conceptual, what else could I use this knot for? So linking it out to other concepts. But for us, procedural knowledge is probably most important. But we get all four here in this. And um, that's why I use this format in my books because a lot of the information I pass on to other people is skill-based. Because if, if we're learning wilderness survival, if we're learning climbing, if we're learning anything in Kines, it tends to have a process to it. And I like to try to incorporate as many learning styles into my course activities as I can for students so they can be as efficient as possible. So this is exactly what we would have done in an in-class activity.